Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the gathering. It's good to see everybody here. Me. Keep in mind that we're here to uh, further our relationship with God, to strengthen <coughs> our faith, and also to keep learning what being a disciple of Jesus is all about. That's why the gathering exists, to help our growth in discipleship. So keep that in mind. Uh, also, uh, we've got an Advent study coming up on the last Wednesday of this month at the Hampton. So if you haven't picked up your book or signed up, make sure you do that. Uh, hopefully you're bringing your shoe boxes back as well as your hats and mittens and gloves. Uh, I know we've got a bunch out there, so Cindy, you can take those with you, hopefully. And I'll be taking the shoe boxes to get them delivered, so keep that in mind. Is there any other announcements? Did you have an announcement here? Yeah. Um, several years ago, um, the gathering was kind enough to help one of my roommates from college. And I had dinner with her this week, and she wanted to pay it forward because she is in a much better place now. Oh, cool. Wow. 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 Thank you. Tell her thank you very much. God bless her, and uh, that's what the gathering is all about. Um, I was just uh, telling Linda that uh, tonight at the Gathering North, we're probably going to be providing a, a woman who uh, is homeless uh, with a week's stay at a hotel. Uh, you know, the cheapest we could find, but it's a decent one. It's a Super 8. So, I mean, these are the type of things that we do constantly, constantly. And so... <laughs> I say, how cool is that? <laughs> so, uh, yes, ma'am. I have some announcements. Sure. Go ahead. So, some of you know that Sandy Schlichten was in the hospital for a couple of days, and she was having symptoms that mimicked other symptoms of things. They, to this day, can't figure out what's wrong with her. She's back home now. Um, she's like at fifty percent. She's, it was like a train hit her. So please keep Sandy in your prayers um, that she gets through quickly whatever she's going through and gets her energy back. Um, Stephanie, her daughter, is having a second baby in two months and um, has a one-year-old now, so she really needs her mommy at full speed. Um, the other thing is, one of our young disciples um, is finishing up her schooling down in southern Illinois, and she's going to be coming back up here to the Chicago Land area. She's doing her student teaching. Uh, she's doing her student teaching in Bensonville, and she's going to school in Oak Lawn. Poor girl. She needs to rent a room. Um, her family is going to help her um, pay the money for renting a room, so we're putting it out in this church and then her other sister in church that she goes to, that if anyone has a room to rent, um, anywhere east of Carroll Stream, and, or a, a, a in-law arrangement that you're not using anymore, um, come see me. Excellent. And uh, keep in mind that Ray Mumpson's mother died. Uh, some of you know Ray, but uh, she had Alzheimer's and just passed away just sitting there in a chair. So. Sometimes the Alzheimer's actually starts to work on your involuntary stuff. And so apparently that's what happens. So keep praying your, your prayers. And it's good to have the Johnsons back from Hawaii. And Ray, caught, I mean, uh, not Ray, but Gary caught himself a big 200 pound Marlin. So that was her. Picture, picture. Can I have yeah, pictures on Facebook? Yeah. So apparently it was a 45 minute struggle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but thanks for the check. Tell her thank you so much. God bless her and we're glad that we were able to help. All right, thank you. Okay. Stand. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord who counsels and guides us. Because we keep the Lord ever before us, we shall not be moved. Rejoice. Let your hearts be glad. Let your spirits rejoice and your bodies rest secure. For God does not give us such to death, but shows us the path of life. Praise the Lord. Please continue standing for the opening song.
grace and full assurance of faith, for God has promised to be merciful. God of grace, all around us are wars and rumors of wars, and we are afraid for ourselves and our world. We follow after false leaders and grasp for whatever security we can find. Forgive us, Lord, for we are quick to forget that all of life is in your hands. Renew our hope, increase our courage, and keep us watchful for the signs of your just and peaceful reign that is to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Our guilty hearts have been sprinkled clean, our bodies washed with pure water. Live in peace, forgiven, and free. Thanks be to God. Hear the teaching of Christ. A new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share the peace with one another. The first lesson today is from Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There should be a time of anguish, such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The second lesson is from Hebrews chapter 10. And every priest stands day after day at his service, often again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Here ends the lesson. You stand the gospel. It's from the 13th chapter of Mark. And as he came to out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and at what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished. Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and it will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. As for yourselves, beware, for they will hand you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. 
When they bring you to trial and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. <coughs> brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. So, I don't know about you, but I didn't hear much about the second coming of Christ till I got to college. And it uh, kind of started when uh, my roommate, uh, Lenny DeClue, who I've talked about before, moved into my, my trailer, the trailer that I was renting uh, down there at SIU in Carbondale in Robinson Trailer Court. It was kind of a neat trailer. It was a two-story trailer. Yeah, it had a bottom and then a... And upstairs, you, you couldn't walk upstairs, but you could walk on all fours, and it had a bedroom up there, and like a little uh, side room that was uh, where you could store things, and that was all black, and I had black lights in there, so it was kind of cool. So I lived upstairs, and uh, Lenny was downstairs in the bedroom, and we shared the kitchen and bathroom areas. But Lenny, a lot of times, you know, I told you, he's a born-again Christian. He used to be a big drug dealer in Carbondale, but he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And uh, he would sit there and he would read a scripture. And sometimes he would read it out loud. And sometimes he would uh, meditate. And of course, you know, I would oftentimes say, you know, Lenny, what are you doing all this for? And he says, well, I'm preparing myself for the coming of Christ. <laughs> That's what he would say every time. I'm preparing myself for the coming of Christ. And so he would tell me, you know, what his thoughts were on the second coming of Christ. Well, as some of you know, I recently was able to contact Lenny and make connections with him through Facebook. Isn't that amazing what Facebook can do? And he now lives down in Springfield, and uh, he also wrote a book about the second coming of Christ. And it's a, called A Book of Remembrance, a story that is told by Leonard de Clue. And on the back he says... Uh, God does not have to sit down and write himself a book to know his plan in our creation. The series of global wars and commotions which began in the last century are signs Jesus outlined. But he also spoke of the by and by when nation will rise against nation and then kingdom against kingdom before he returns in glory. Failure to grasp these perils and the purpose they serve in conversion or apostasy distorts the day of his second coming. So it's a great book. I've been able to start reading it, but uh, there's Lenny right there. And uh, isn't that amazing? But that's where I first started to learn a little bit more about the second coming of Christ, because we as Lutherans don't talk much about it. Okay? So... Then, as you well know, I got into Campus Crusade for Christ. And uh, Campus Crusade does talk about the second coming, maybe as, not as much as Lenny did, but they do talk about it. And I remember when I was out there in Pennsylvania, some of you know that I went out to Pennsylvania to help start a fire protection business uh, with my dad called Safe Tech Associates. Uh, we were in the fire protection business, but uh, while I was doing that, uh, this is all before I ended seminary, uh, we lived uh, on the outskirts of Philadelphia in a town called Westchester. And uh, there was a community college there called Westchester State. And they had a, a campus crusade group there. So I remember one time when we all sat down and uh, uh, they brought in, you know, this big honcho from Campus Crusade who was supposed to be the big theologian, uh, the great uh, knowledge one, you might say. And for a whole hour, this guy was using prophecy and Bible verses and numbers from the scriptures and uh, he was going to tell us when Jesus was going to come again. So for a whole hour he went through all this rigmarole and all this stuff and we were all like, wow. And then after about an hour he comes up with the number. Seven, 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 seven. And he said, Jesus is going to come again on July 7th, 1977. And this was in, we were doing, we were sitting there in 1975. Okay, this was in 1975 that we were sitting there watching him do this. I forgot to tell you that. So he says, he's going to come 
about a year after we celebrate our bicentennial. It's going to be three days after we celebrate 4th of July, one day for the Father, one day for the Son, and one day for the Holy Spirit. That's 7777. And 7 is that perfect number. And we all sat there and went, wow. <laughs> well, you all know it's been 43 years since we sat there. And it's been, what, uh, uh, 41 years since it was supposed to happen. Okay, God bless him. I don't know where he is today. But people have always tried to predict the second coming of Jesus. And the bottom line is, we just don't know. We just don't know when that's going to happen. It's one of these great mysteries. You know, I can imagine, uh, you know, I mean, uh, what it was like for those disciples, you know, after they saw him ascend <laughs> to heaven. I'm sure they probably thought that it was going to be maybe a couple of days or maybe a couple of hours before he would be coming back again, don't you think? <clears throat> I mean, that's what I would be thinking about. Oh, man, I hope he comes back tomorrow. You know, he just ascended today. Oh, he's going to be back tomorrow. You can imagine what these disciples uh, were thinking after Jesus ascended, that that whole concept of his second coming, because they remembered him talking about it, was probably foremost on their mind. And, and the Apostle Paul himself, who wasn't present at the uh, ascension of Jesus, um, you know, it's obvious that he was impacted by this whole concept of the second coming himself. Because um, when you read like his first uh, letters that he ever wrote, which were first and second Thessalonians, uh, which was kind of early in his career, man, he's talking to the, to the church in Thessalonica in a way that he's going, okay guys, uh, keep your nose clean, don't do anything stupid, just uh, don't get involved in anything that's gonna take you away from Jesus, just, just be ready, just be ready, because Jesus is coming back at any moment, so just, just be ready. That's what First and Second Thessalonians is all about. <laughs> you know? So it's obvious that the Apostle Paul at the beginning of his uh, career was thinking about you know, the, the imminent coming of Jesus Christ. But then when he writes the book of Romans, which was probably written about 15 to 20 years after those first letters to the church in Thessalonica, <laughs> it's obvious that the Apostle Paul you know, has kind of figured out the fact that that, that maybe Jesus ain't coming back as soon as I thought he was, okay? <laughs> and that's okay, because he writes the book of Romans uh, as a long-term theological treatise. It's almost like he gave us a gift, saying, yeah, guys, I know that he may not come back you know, in my lifetime, but here's a treatise, the book of Romans, for long-term Christian theology. If you read the book of Romans, that's, that's what it's all about. And we're still using those long-term concepts even today that the Apostle Paul wrote. So it's obvious that he made a switch. He suddenly realized, yep, Jesus is coming back, but he may not be coming back as soon as I want him to come back. And so we just don't know. We have no idea when he might be coming back. In fact, Luther, you know, talked about it himself. But, but Luther put a, a positive spin, kind of like on the, uh, the whole concept of the second coming of Christ. And he writes here in, in this uh, devotional book, uh, he says, Even if your sin and your conscience plague and oppress you, and you stand in awe of God's judgment, you must realize that all has been changed and that judgment has been abolished. Instead of harboring fear of the last judgment, you must yearn and long for it, since it does not denote your judgment at all, but your redemption. At that time, we will be delivered from the last enemy, which is death, and our bodies will rise again from the grave. Devil, death, and worms will cease, and God's disfavor will end. This judgment day will draw you from the grave and deliver you from all evil. Therefore, the day of judgment will be a time of rejoicing for you, far more so than the wedding day is for the bride. For this terrible day has been converted into a happy 
and desirable day for you. Thus all is well if you believe and have faith. But those who love darkness more than light uh, will experience the reverse. <laughs> they must live in dread of that last day. But for the believer, the thought of this day should be comforting, since condemnation and the terrible judgment are gone. Isn't that amazing? Luther always had that tendency to kind of put a positive spin on things. So that, that was kind of cool. But, you know, as for me, you know, I, I don't know. Just like you, I have no idea when it's going to take place. This second coming that our lessons seem to be pointing towards. Every one of our lessons this morning is kind of like a second coming lesson. It points towards the fact that Jesus will come again someday. And I have no idea whether it's going to be 2,000 more years, 200 more years, two more years, you know, two months, two weeks, two days, two hours, two minutes. It could happen any time. All I have control over is how am I living my life? <laughs> you know, what am I doing with my life? That's the only thing I have control over. I can't tell when Jesus is going to come again. But it could happen at any minute. So I have to be, you know, like uh, living with that sense of expectation that hopefully when he comes again, I'll be uh, in cahoots with his will, you know, living the type of life that he hopefully wants me to live. And that's not easy sometimes, but that's what I'm called to do. And so I think about the certain roles that I've been gifted with when I think about the preparation for his imminent coming. Uh, I have to ask myself, you know, am I a warrior for the Lord? Do I take seriously the whole concept that there is such a thing as spiritual warfare? That there is a battle going on that started when Jesus first came into this world and opened his mouth and said, the kingdom of God is at hand, and boom! All of a sudden, this new battle spiritual battle between God and Satan, good and evil, uh, demonic and angelic forces started to take place. Do I believe in that? Now, for me, that's important. But you can go from one extreme to the other when this whole thing, you know, and this whole thing about, you know, this spiritual warfare. Um, you know, you've got books like... Uh, Present Darkness with Frank Peretti that was written back in the uh, late 80s where, you know, he, he basically talks about demonic and angelic forces being, being present right around you and around everybody. I mean, it's kind of like an eye-opening kind of experience. And so that's kind of like one extreme where there's a lot of talk about uh, angelic and demonic forces actually helping and controlling situations and working in people's lives. Uh, you've got that extreme and I'm not saying that's bad, all the way to uh, our modern-day Lutheran seminaries, <laughs> which are the other extreme. And I've told you this before, when I was still at St. Philip in Glenview, uh, a few months before I resigned, uh, I got a call from the person in charge of Christian education, or the whole education at the seminary, at the Lutheran Theological Seminary, that told me that the girl that was uh, uh, going to do her field education at St. Philip has suddenly been removed and placed to another church uh, not too far in Park Ridge from Glenview. Why? Because I had told this young girl that I believed in the existence of the devil and I believed evil was real. That's all I said. I didn't talk about demonic forces or a <laughs> joke. And she went back and told this lady and was asked, you know, you better leave. So that's the other extreme where they don't really believe anymore in the existence of the devil or that evil is real. That's the kind of progressive thinking that's going on, or whatever you want to call it, in our seminaries today. And then you have uh, writers, people who write like uh, Rick Renner, Sparkling Gems, that we sometimes use, where he does talk about the devil and evil in, uh, you know, in some of his uh, 
daily devotions. Uh, maybe a little bit more than some of us could care for, but he does bring it in. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's up to you to decide where you are in that spectrum, okay? <laughs> but for me, uh, the whole concept of, uh, of the existence of the devil and evil really didn't become real until about 20 years ago when I was still at LCM, and uh, some of you remember this gentleman, good old Hank Fanter. <laughs> he was kind of a different person, God bless him, but God bless him, he, he was full of the Holy Spirit, you know, the guy that played the accordion, and, and, uh, and he came up to me one day and he said, Pastor Dawson, you talk so much about a loving and gracious God, and I appreciate that, but what are you going to talk about the opposite side of the spectrum, about the devil and the evil in this world? You never talk about that in your sermons. And it struck me, yeah. I don't, because as Lutheran pastors, we were never taught that. <laughs> Sorry. And I started talking a little bit more about it as time went on. And it suddenly dawned on me that, yeah, you know, uh, uh, with the prompting of Hank, and uh, that, that uh, you know, the devil is real. <laughs> And evil is real. And ever since then, you know, it, it's been obvious that Satan kind of comes after me, uh, you know, lock, stock, and barrel about every six to seven years. I don't know about you, but it's that in between, you know, six to imperfect and seven to, you know, it's like he puts me through the ringer. And it's up to me to survive, okay, and to cling, and to hopefully uh, come out of it okay. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's what my life has been <coughs> since that time. But, um, in the arena of my life, uh, you have to keep in mind that Satan will stop at nothing to uh, control your free will. I'm serious. In the arena of, and the battle of spiritual warfare, Satan is fighting with two hands against God. God, unfortunately, is fighting with one hand tied behind his back because he's waiting for us to say, not my will, but thy will be done. That's how much he respects our free will. He's willing to take a beating in the arena of, uh, of life, in a battle, until we say, ah, you know, yes, Lord, you know. It's a free will, loving and gracious response to loving and gracious God. Boom! And that other hand comes out as soon as you say, not my will, but thy will be done. And puts a sucker punch to Satan and knocks him out. That's the amazing thing. But he's waiting for that. So that's how that whole concept of spiritual warfare takes place. And, and amazingly enough, uh, I, I grow each time. <laughs> and just when you think you've reached it, along comes something else. You'll never give up till the day you die. And that's when you divest yourself of that struggle. But that's how we grow. That's why it's so important that not only am I a warrior for the Lord, but I'm, that I'm also a soldier for Christ. The Apostle Paul says, you are a soldier for Christ in the book of Ephesians 6.13. Put on the armor of God, he says. Put on the armor of God. Put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and use your shield of faith and your spirit, the sword of the spirit, so that you can walk in the shoes of peace and be a representative of mine. That's what being a soldier of Christ is all about. And of course, I've showed you this before, you know. Victoria handed these out a couple of years ago. It's got all that good stuff in there. And for me, that breastplate of righteousness is probably the most important because it surrounds my heart and my torso. And it's God's way of saying to me, you are redeemed. And because you are redeemed, you have a right 
relationship with me. That's what righteousness is all about. That can never be taken away from you. Okay? And that's the firm foundation. That's what Luther was talking about. We stand in his redemption. And probably the next part of that whole armor of God that was based on the Roman soldier was the belt of truth. If you and I are living in some form of ongoing deception, that's going to give you know, Satan a way in, whatever that deception may be. We have to be willing to, to eliminate it, confess it, deal with it, lift it up to the Lord and deal with it, and get it out of there. Uh, in fact, uh, Scott Peck, who wrote the book The Road Less, Less Traveled, also wrote a book called The People of the Lie. And he writes in that book, The People of the Lie, that whenever there is an ongoing deception in a person's life, that's where evil has a tendency to creep in and start getting a hold of that person's heart, and mind, and soul. So it's, it's an important concept of belt of truth, which kind of girds and keeps everything together. And then the helmet of salvation is what helps me control my thoughts. Hopefully. Because that's where the battleground is, is in your mind. You know that. Your heart might be in the right place, but man, he'll play games up here. <coughs> Woo! All right? Amen to that. And that's where, you know, you have to use everything that God has available to you to help you Control your thoughts. Rick Renner is really good at that in his Sparkling Gems book about controlling your thoughts. And then uh, once you get the breastplate, the truth, and uh, the helmet of salvation, and then you can start using the armor, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the shield of faith, you know, to, to guard you from all the arrows, the flaming arrows from Satan. I've got my armor, my... You guys got this green, remember the green bracelet? Man, mine is tattered. My shield of faith is actually torn. It's actually stapled together. <laughs> That's how much right there, see it? But it's still together. I've actually got it in my shield of faith. This is the armor of God bracelet, you know, from Ephesians 6.13. So uh, that shield of faith. And then you can use that sword of the Spirit to cut through all the webs. Because Satan will try to, like a spider web, to try to, you know, you got to cut through. And once you're able to do battle, then you can walk in the shoes of Shalom and be a representative for Christ in everything you say and do. Isn't that amazing? But it's a learning concept, folks. You don't learn. Just like a Roman soldier had to learn how to use this armor and how to carry it, you've got to learn how to do it. And that's where my third role comes in. I'm not only a warrior for the Lord and a soldier for Christ, but I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm one of his disciples. Which means that I'm in a constant learning process. I don't call myself Christian anymore. I really don't. Because the word Christian doesn't really mean much to anybody anymore. Sorry. But if somebody asks me who I am, I say I'm a disciple of Jesus. <laughs> That's a whole different ballgame. Because it means that my learning curve has gone from this, which is the world's, to this. Once you make your mind up that you want to be this, your learning curve never ends. You grow and grow and you become the person whom God wants you to be. And it's a never-ending process that involves prayer, fellowship, worship, and Bible study. Isn't that right? All those icky things that you don't really want to get involved in until you start you're getting involved and you see how beautiful they are and that they are really tasty stuff. Prayer, worship, Bible study, and fellowshipping with other Christians so that you can learn how to put on that new nature and deny the old nature, crucify it, so that you can learn what it means to let go and let God in certain situations, so that you can learn to stop the don'ts and get into the do's, 
so that you can learn that you not only have a vertical relationship with God, but that vertical relationship with God means absolutely nothing unless you strap on the horizontal. <clears throat> and where it crosses where, is where your heart is. Isn't that amazing? That this is how we're called to live. And that process of discipleship is a never-ending process. It's a constant process of RC, R squared. Is that right, Mike? RC, what is that? Reflection, confession, repentance, and renewal. We just talked about it this past Wednesday. Reflection, constant process of reflection, confession if necessary, repentance, and renewal, which is ready and available to you and I, lickety-split, because that's how much God loves us. We can renew, just like a chameleon, every day, you know, put on a new part, grow. Isn't that amazing? And that's the three roles that I play. Warrior for the Lord, soldier for Christ, disciple for Jesus, and one more. So bear with me, one more. Being a citizen of God's kingdom. <laughs> How many times are we told that uh, we are in this world, but not of this world. We live in this world, but once we make a decision for Jesus, we kind of live in a totally different way. How many times have I said to you, Jesus never came to start what? A man-made religion, but what? A one-on-one, -on -one faith-based movement of discipleship to further what? The Lutheran Church? No. The what? Kingdom the kingdom of God. of God. Read your scriptures. Read Paul. That's it, folks. A one-on-one -on -one faith based movement to further the kingdom of God of discipleship. Isn't that amazing? That's what he came to start. And that's a process of believing and receiving and incorporating what God has to offer and then extrapolating or sharing it with the rest of the world so that we can be the earthen vessels through which he flows out into the world to further his kingdom. He needs you and I to further his kingdom. He's dependent on human flesh to further his kingdom. Without us, he cannot further his kingdom. That's how dependent he is on flowing through each one of us into our daily lives. That's, again, read your scriptures. So we're extremely important in that. So we have to make up our minds whether we're going to live uh, counterculturally, illogically, going against the very grain of our human nature, or anti-instinctively. We have to make up our minds whether we're going to live like this, which is instinctive, or we're just going to be civil, like society expects us to be, or are we willing to stretch and go out here in everything we say and do? Ooh. Folks, I'm writing a, another saying for uh, Facebook. I sometimes put these things out on occasion, but this is called, by what arm slash hand position do you live by? And it says, we are all born in the fetal position. It's a natural position with our arms in front of us and our hands clenched in a protective posture. It's also a great offensive stance, like a boxer, ready to strike. And there are people who live their whole lives in this position. And why not? Why not? It's an easy way to carry oneself with one with arms and hands in front, held close to one's body. One could stand all day in this clenched fist position, but society is there to teach us how to live beyond the fetal position, how to be civil by asking us not to clench our fists, but to open up our hands and move each arm to its respective side at shoulder height. This is called the live and let live position. It's neither offensive or defensive. It's kind of neutral. This, this is what being civil is all about. Society 
from the moment you enter first grade and everything tries to teach you to move here, which is good, which is good. This is cool. Yeah. Okay. But totally neutral in posture. And like the fetal position, one can comfortably remain in the live and let live position for quite an extended period of time. Not offending or defending oneself, but remaining a neutral entity by ignoring what is going on around us. We can easily live in this position and ignore our neighbor for years or the one who works with us. Okay? For thousands of years, human beings had only these two stances to choose. For thousands of years, they only had the fetal or civil position to choose from until our divine creator decided to send his son to teach us a whole new <coughs> stance for living. Come follow me, he said, and I will teach you to live with outstretched arms and open hands so that you can learn to embrace the world and let the world embrace you. Isn't that amazing? For thousands of years, they only had two positions, but now we have a third. This new stance, Jesus said, will take you beyond the naturally born fetal position and beyond what society expects of us in a civil position. But be warned, he said, this is an unnatural position. You cannot keep your arms outstretched for very long. You have to rely on your God-given faith to keep those arms outstretched as you go about your daily activities. Remember, he said, you are vulnerable when your arms are outstretched with your hands in the open palm position. You can't defend yourself or strike back. Instead, your hands will bump into people. <laughs> but this is the new way that God the Father wants you to live. It's a brand new stance for living that has never existed before. It's called bearing one's cross, and it will change your life and the lives of those you touch and embrace with those outstretched arms and open hands. That's, isn't that amazing? Please rise. Well, we'll just thank you again for uh, the second coming of Christ. Help us to be warriors, soldiers, uh, disciples, and citizens uh, for your glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
to call everyone to know and follow Christ, and to proclaim to all the assurance that in the name of Jesus there is forgiveness of sin and new life for all who repent and believe. The Spirit calls all members to embrace God's mission in their neighborhoods and in the world, to feed the hungry, bring water to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, and free the prisoner. We repent of leaving this work to a few, for this mission is central to our being. Amen. With glad and generous hearts, let us bring our offerings to God. Amen. Amen. Please receive it for the offer.
going to be with uh, Ray Mumpson as he grieves the loss of his mom. He'll be with Molly uh, with Guidance and Carl. He'll be with, uh, with Carl as well. All these things we lift up to you in your most precious name, and let's all say, Amen. 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 The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. My Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated and come forward with the usher's direction, please.
Amen. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you his grace through the love. Amen. Amen. Hold fast to hope, for God is faithful. Provoke one another to love and good deeds while you wait and watch for the coming of Christ's reign. Amen. Amen. May the blessing of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit, one God, Father of us all, be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.